Do you like your news with a pinch of Linux and open source? Well, you've come to the wrong place because this is all Linux and open source news. This week, we have AMD moving their firmware to a fully open source core boot compatible alternative. We have System76 unveiling more details about their cosmic desktop, which will be very customizable. And we have some new interesting defaults that will make their way into Plasma 6. So grab a coffee, sit back and enjoy the news right after this message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is the only solution I use to run my own Nextcloud server and my only Office server as well. It's a super easy solution to deploy basically anything you want in one click. They have a huge marketplace of applications you can host from Nextcloud, WordPress, Drupal, GitLab or Grafana to gaming servers for Minecraft, Arc, CSGO, Rust, Valheim and more. They take care of all the configuration for you. All you have to do is click the thing you want to deploy, fill in a few details and your server is up and running. And once everything is live, it's still super easy to manage your servers, to upgrade or downgrade them, add some storage, back them up, and get help if you're stuck. I've been using Linode for years now, and I can only recommend them. If you want to give them a shot, click the link in the description below, and you'll get $100 of free credit to get started. So it looks like AMD is going to be the ultimate free and open source champion in terms of hardware as they now have announced officially that they're going to shift their firmware from AGESA to OpenSIL. AGESA is their current library to initialize AMD CPUs on your motherboard. It's a part of the motherboard's BIOS that controls the CPU, the RAM and the like. OpenSIL is their new open source project for firmware and already has support for 4th gen EPIC CPUs as a proof of concept. And it won't be limited to server hardware either. AMD announced that it will fully replace their previous firmware and all products will be covered by 2026. AMD stated that they're committed to open source software and that the new open architecture will reduce the attack surface and be more scalable. This new library can interface with Core Boot and other open firmware solutions, which is really cool. And they're collaborating with other organizations like American Megatrend, which is a notorious provider of ugly blue BIOS and UEFI interfaces. Now, of course, it's just a first step and the code isn't production ready. And for now, integration with Core Boot and support for Ryzen CPUs isn't there, but it's super encouraging. And I can't wait to see more Linux devices with this open firmware. That's one less part of your system that's going to be proprietary. So that's always good. System76 unveiled more details about their upcoming Cosmic desktop environment. This time they talked about panels, which will be able to be customized heavily. They will contain user-picked applets, which seem to be their equivalents to GNOME extensions. Panels will be completely customizable with the on-screen position, the screen edge, the ability to add a margin to make them float. You'll be able to stack them on top of one another, have them not use the whole width or height of the screen. Each panel will also have the option to be set to light or dark mode and be shown on all or just one specific display. It's nothing we haven't seen in other desktop environments, but it's still far away from what GNOME currently offers on Pop! OS, so it's nice to see. They also talked a bit about the settings, they are working on the wallpaper and keyboard input pages, but the settings app will have an API to add or remove pages, so projects that might want to use or to integrate with Cosmic will have the option to enrich the settings if they need to. The work on HDR support also continued and one of System76's developers joined the recent hackfest on that topic, which I talked about in last week's video. System76 plans to support HDR when general support is available, as they estimated in a couple of years. They also added 10-bit color support and worked on adding an accessibility framework on the Iced library that they used to build their desktop. Now this project is shaping up really nicely. It's nice to see that they're also going the customization route and not just trying to reproduce the exact same thing they have with GNOME right now. So yeah, can't wait to get my hands on it. It looks really good. 
There are also some interesting changes that will come to KDE Plasma's default in Plasma 6. So they had a development sprint this week hosted in the offices of Tuxedo Computers in Germany. And the team has decided to change a few things. First, double click will be the default. Opening files and folders will require you to work your fingers a bit more than now. Although, of course, you will still get the option to move back to single click if you prefer it. Wayland will also be the default in Plasma 6. But of course, distros will be able to pick X11 if they prefer. It's more of a recommendation from the Plasma developers than anything really enforceable. This means they went over the list of Wayland issues to focus on the ones that are really problematic, like some NVIDIA related issues. Panels will now be floating by default as well. And the reason seems pretty funny. They said that because Windows 11 blatantly copied Plasma, people are starting to think things went the other way around and that Plasma is a Windows 11 clone. And that's a misconception they want to move away from. And so having a floating panel is a nice way to show that they have the advantage. Until Windows 12 copies that as well, because not only are their designers completely incapable of restyling the entirety of Windows, but they also don't seem to have any original ideas. All the window headers in Plasma will now also use the accent color to tint the window color by default, which also looks really good and has the added benefit of making it easier to notice which window is currently active. The task switcher will move to the thumbnail grid style you can already use in Plasma 5, which is subjectively much better than the vertical panel that they use by default right now. Other smaller changes include disabling scrolling on the desktop to change virtual desktops, at least by default, and allowing users to click in the scroll bar area to jump the scroll bar to the clicked location. And they will also slow down the release cycle. Previous Plasma releases were every four months. And after Plasma 6, they will make one or two releases per year instead. This should allow a lot of distributions to ship the latest version of Plasma with their usual twice a year release schedule. And this will leave the Plasma team more time to polish things up and make sure each new version is as good as it can be. It's an interesting set of changes. It's nothing you can't already do inside of Plasma 5, but I think those defaults will make the experience for newcomers more familiar and easy to grasp. And let's finish this desktop environment roundup with the usual weekly GNOME updates. First, GNOME Maps now uses some snazzy overlay buttons for rotation and zoom, instead of putting them in the header bar. Rotation also now has keyboard shortcuts as well. There's a new update to Letterpress, a nice geeky little app to turn an image into ASCII art. And there's a brand new app for AI enjoyers called Imaginer, which lets you generate pictures using stable diffusion, OpenAI, OpenJourney, Portrait Plus, and a lot more. Bavardé, the AI text generator, also got an update that now supports formatting the output, like code or tables, and has some documentation to let you know how to obtain a token from ChatGPT. Tube Converter, the video downloader, can now stop all downloads in one click, or retry failed ones, and clear the old downloads in the queue. Flare, the Signal client, got some style changes to better separate your own messages from messages sent by other people and channels without any messages are now hidden by default. GNOME developers also progressed on the QA tests tooling, so it will be easier to automate GNOME testing in the future. And finally, since the Google Summer of Code program is set to begin, GNOME will get nine contributors who will work on a new system panel for the settings, integrating the network displays feature into the settings as well, or syncing flat packs between devices, among other things. And okay, I make no secret that I'm not a big fan of AI tools. I dabbled with them a little bit, but the ethics behind the content they use and the attribution or copyright still ticks me off. But if you like AI, having those desktop applications to interact with it is actually pretty cool. New rumors seem to point to Microsoft wanting to strike a deal with Firefox to make Bing the default search engine instead of Google. Firefox is currently mainly funded by Google with a giant search deal, and this thing is up for renewal this year. Microsoft apparently would be interested in replacing Google, probably in an effort to push Bing outside of Windows, 
where they already go all in into user hostile territory by making getting rid of Edge or Bing basically impossible. Thing is, since Firefox is the default browser in most Linux distributions, this change would probably not last very long on most users' systems, as people would switch back to Google or a privacy-respecting search engine, like DuckDuckGo, Ecosia, Startpage and the like, which might make the deal pretty useless for Microsoft. I mean, how many of you guys that use Firefox would keep Bing as the default search engine if it made its way to your system? Like, let me know in the comments, I'm genuinely interested. Now, Thunderbird published their annual financial report, and it might sound drab and boring, but it contains a lot of interesting things. First, it looks like donations have skyrocketed in 2022, reaching almost $6.5 million, which makes 99% of their revenue. Thunderbird now employs 24 people, including a lot of design and UX-focused roles, to transition Thunderbird into a more user-friendly application. What's more interesting, though, is a few remarks in their blog post. First, they're looking to hire an iOS developer in 2023 to have an iOS client for Thunderbird to match the future Android app based on K9 Mail. Second, they're looking at some avenues to generate revenue through new tools and services, but they also stated that they will not hamstring the current experience to do so, so you won't have any paywalled feature that you currently enjoy on Thunderbird. Some of these tools will be introduced in 2023, so we'll have to wait and see what they are exactly. If I had to hazard a guess, I would say they would offer email addresses that you can sign up for, or maybe additional plugins, like for example, one to support Exchange. Now still, it's really cool to see an app that was basically dead 10 years ago, rise up and become extremely well-funded, super transparent. It's really cool. And let's finish this with the gaming news. So for Roblox players, Linux will soon not be an option at all, or it already is not an option, as the developers have confirmed that they will block Wine and Proton, they won't support it in any way, as they don't want to enable anti-cheat support for it. They cite fears over Wine users cheating, which, as far as I know, doesn't have any factual basis. So, no Linux client and no way to play Roblox on Linux using the Windows client, unless someone figures out a workaround that doesn't get you banned. Good news for Steam, though, as the desktop client for Linux will soon use the global scale factor that is set by GNOME or KDE. The latest beta adds this support, which means everyone will benefit from it in a few weeks at most, and your Steam client will now not look either huge or super tiny on your high resolution screen. And for Intel or AMD users, the Mesa drivers 23.1 are now out, which will now support Rust ICL, an OpenCL implementation that doesn't need ROCM or the AMD GPU Pro drivers, which might be a way to run DaVinci Resolve on Linux on AMD without moving to the AMD GPU Pro drivers. They also reduced single file shader caches in terms of disk space, the new graphics pipeline is now enabled, which should help a lot with in-game stutters while the shaders are being built. Plus, there are some performance improvements for AMD GPUs, including for the Steam Deck, there's better Intel support, and more. And depending on your distro, you'll either get this really soon, or you'll have to wait for the next major version. And I'm more and more interested about the developments in the Mesa drivers because, well, not only do I own a Steam Deck, but I also just bought a nice graphics card uh, from AMD, a 6550 XT, to build my own Steam console. So I'm excited to see what kind of performance improvements they can bring to this. And I'm excited to tell you about our sponsor. If you're looking to replace your current PC with something that runs Linux, stop buying devices from manufacturers that only ship Windows, Buy something from Tuxedo by clicking the link in the description below. They make laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. All the components are picked to run well with Linux. And they have a big range that should suit every price point and every need. Every device is very customizable when you buy it with the RAM, the SSD, the processor, even sometimes the dedicated GPUs on certain laptops or desktops. You decide. And all their laptops are openable, repairable, upgradable, including the RAM, the SSD, the battery, and sometimes the wireless card. So if you need a new computer and you want to run Linux on it, click the link in the description below and buy a Tuxedo PC. 
So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, well, you can always dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really enjoy the channel, well, you can support it by clicking any of the links in the description below for LibraPay, Patreon, YouTube memberships, YouTube thanks, PayPal, whatever. You know how this works. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.